Welcome back to the final part of my three-part series where I explore the geology of southern Utah. Last time we visited my favorite national park, Arches, and learned why the park is so unique and how arches form. This week, me, Geology Joes, and my friend, Jacob the Disney Adult, take on Capitol Reef National Park, and together we will discover how plate tectonics, uplift, folding, and faulting shaped this landscape. My first question is why is it called Capitol Reef? Is it because there is fossil evidence of coral reefs in the park? That was my first thought, but the answer is far less geological. Early travelers to the area noticed the huge dome-shaped fin made out of Navajo sandstone, which you cannot miss when you drive through Capitol Reef. It reminded explorers of the early U.S. Capitol building in Washington, D.C. They also found this land difficult to traverse with wagon and livestock, comparing a particularly troublesome section to an ocean reef. This hard-to-navigate section is known now as the Water Pocket Fold. When you travel along Utah State Route 24 through Capitol Reef National Park, you can actually cross the Water Pocket Fold, known as one of the longest exposed monoclines in North America, coming in at approximately 100 miles in length. In Part 1, we discussed the difference between synclines and anticlines, but what is a monocline? A monocline is like a half-fold. Only one limb is bent within an otherwise horizontal or gently dipping rock layer or layers. So how exactly did the water pocket monocline form? Southern Utah went through a 280 million year process of deposition, global plate movement, uplift from subduction, folding and faulting, and erosion to form and expose this grandiose structure. That's a long time, so let's break it down. Plate tectonics. You probably know that Earth's crust is composed of several plates that are thought to move by convection currents created in the mantle. These plates move around, drift apart, and bump into each other, creating various geological features like mountains, volcanoes, and rift valleys. This movement also creates mega features like supercontinents. Many of the rock layers exposed in Capitol Reef were deposited at sea level during the time of the supercontinent Pangaea, which existed from 270 to 180 million years ago. Deposition. During the formation of Pangaea 270 million years ago in the Permian time period, Southern Utah was a shallow sea with coastal dunes. In this shallow sea, we would find sponges, trilobites, and crinoids. This is when we see the deposition of the Kaibab limestone and white rim sandstone. Around 250 million years ago in the Triassic time period, sea level receded and the environment resembled a coastal mudflat where the Moenkopi siltstone and mudstone is deposited on top of the Kaibab limestone. The ancestors of crocodiles and alligators call this place home. Following was the Chinle, Wingate, and Kayenta formations, which were discussed in Part 1 and show a history of shifting environments from a swampy floodplain environment to a desert sand dune environment. Then, approximately 180 million years ago, Pangaea broke up. Plate tectonics caused Utah to move farther inland and away from the ocean, consequently creating a desert environment with massive sand dunes and scattered oases with early pine trees. This is when the Navajo sandstone was deposited. Working our way up through time until today, we can see that the environment within present-day southern Utah continued to shift as sea level and plates moved from near equator to its current position. Deposition of a variety of rock types continued, including the occasional deposition of ash from the distant volcanic eruptions. Nothing of tectonic significance happened until the Colorado Plateau slowly started to uplift. Uplift. Yeah. Okay, now leave the shot. 
Approximately 35 to 75 million years ago, oceanic plates subducted underneath the North American continental plate. When an oceanic plate converges with a continental plate, the oceanic plate will subduct because it is more dense. The subducted plate eventually melts partially as it descends into the earth. This partial melting leads to rising magma plumes, causing uplift in the crust and eventually the development of volcanoes. This type of plate boundary movement typically gives rise to large earthquakes and volcanic activity. The rock layers that make up the water pocket fold as previously mentioned began to experience differential uplift during the Laramie orogeny. The Laramie orogeny, which is a series of mountain building events that affected much of western North America in the late Cretaceous and Paleogene, caused the reactivation of an ancient fault that offset overlying rock layers. Folding and folding. The Laramie orogeny lifted rocks on the west side of the fault 7,000 feet higher than those on the east side of the fault. The layers did not break when pulled apart. Instead, they folded or draped over the fault, creating the monocline known as the water pocket fold. The water pocket fold contains nearly a complete collection of Mesozoic rocks ranging from 80 to 280 million years old, which is the area that includes the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous time periods, also known as the age of the dinosaurs. The layers we frequently saw at Canyonlands were the Chinle, Kayenta, Wingate, and Navajo. In arches, the most frequented layers we saw were the Entrada and Carmel, which are integral to forming those famous arches. In Capitol Reef, we see all of those and more thanks to the powerful forces of erosion. erosion. Capitol Reef's visible rock layers began forming approximately 280 million years ago. The park's oldest exposed rocks can be traced back to the Permian, which can be found in Sulphur Creek goosenecks. Goosenecks are areas of a canyon or valley that resembles a goose's neck. They are caused by uneven resistance to erosion, which results in tight curves and deep incisions. So right here is very interesting. So the river used to flow under this overhang. That's why it's, it looks the way it does. But the creek found a more straight path and is now flowing where it currently is. I'm sure in times where there's a lot more water, water might be diverted around this way. The youngest rocks in the park consist of volcanic boulders. These boulders are chunks of basalt and andesite formed by lava flows on mountaintops to the west from approximately 25 million years ago. Rates of erosion are high on mountaintops, which cause the lava flows to break into boulders. During floods and debris flows, those boulders were carried down the mountains to Capitol Reef 5,000 to 150,000 years ago. Additionally, underneath this area, magma rose through cracks in the crust. Eventually, as magma approached the surface, it cooled slowly until it turned into rock three to six million years ago. Erosion has exposed these igneous formations known as dikes, sills, and volcanic plugs, where you can find rocks full of crystals. These igneous rocks represent the Cenozoic era, which is the current area that we are living in. This area comes directly after the Mesozoic, also known as the Age of the Dinosaurs. It marks the extinction after non-avian dinosaurs and introduces the age of mammals. Oh, cool.
The hike we are currently on is called Cottonwood Wash. It's right outside of Capitol Reef and a great option for dispersed camping if you have four-wheel drive. As you continue down the trail, the canyon becomes more narrow until you are traversing very tight slots. Shot. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> Unfortunately, we had to turn around a couple miles in due to a flooded slot. How deep you think it is? Yeah, it looks kind of deep. <laughs> it, it, it looks a little bit like we cannot go further. Oh, there's a little bug in there. What do you think's in there? Probably everything. Snakes? Yeah. You think you're in there? Yeah, it looks like a couple feet deep. Yeah, I'm not, going, I'm not doing that. No, I'm not either. But I do have my sandals on. Well. <laughs> you shall not pass. <laughs> The team shies away from the clamber and continues on the ledge. Next time I visit Capitol Reef, I definitely want to make it to the end. The first mile or two is pretty boring walking through the wash, but the Slot Canyon is so worth it if you're in the area. Another plus is that it's a low traffic trail, so you probably won't run into anyone. Just like in Arches National Park, you can find arches in Capitol Reef. The Hickman Bridge is probably the most famous arch in the park. It is important to note that all natural bridges are considered arches, but technically speaking, not all arches are bridges. Bridges are a special type of arch that is carved by sediment-laden running water. Rainwater and ice erode narrow fins of sandstone while streams and flash floods carve into the base of these fins until a bridge forms. Well, that's all I have for this episode. If Capitol Reef was not on your list before, I hope it is now. I was so surprised by this national park and will certainly return. If you join me for all three parts of this geology adventure, I hope you enjoyed and I really appreciate the support. If you haven't already, please like this video and subscribe to the channel for more geology in the face. See you next time!